I'm about to make a prediction about Missouri basketball's future that could completely blow up in my face. So join me, won't you? Coming up right now on Locked On Mizzou. You are Locked On Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball joining you after another fine SEC victory. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And you know what? Of course, I do want to talk about the Missouri LSU game last night. Another solid victory for Missouri. Another fabulous offensive performance by our Missouri Tigers. But first, I want to talk about the future of this team. It really occurred to me today, just thinking about something that I really believe in. This is just a pure prediction on my part. This is just me kind of adding two and two together, adding all the pieces, thinking about what could happen and what is most likely to happen next season for your Missouri Tiger basketball team. And I really think that Kobe Brown and Isaiah Mosley are going to come back next year. The more I think about it, and let's start with Isaiah Mosley. How about him? Here's a guy who certainly had NBA aspirations coming into this season. I think a lot of people assumed that Isaiah Mosley would play a season at Missouri and and test the waters at the pro level after this year. But you know what? Obviously, this season has not gone according to plan for Isaiah so far, and or or the Tigers or or the fans for that matter, like you and me. But you know what? Obviously, he's starting to settle in and play good basketball for Missouri. And most importantly, seems like he's having a lot of fun playing big-time basketball in front of a big-time crowd and atmosphere in his hometown. I don't know that we could have said that a couple months ago, but it seems like Isaiah really has, as Dennis Gates sort of alluded to a couple months ago. Well, it seems like he sure is starting to acclimate himself into the program. But if you think about it, Well, maybe Isaiah's having fun this year, but maybe he's still, obviously, I should say, he still has pro aspirations. But to me, I I just don't see those coming to fruition after this season. Sure, he could go overseas and play somewhere, no question about that, and make a decent amount of money doing so. But you got to say, in this day and age, in the new world we live in, this is not three, four, five years ago when, yes, this was still truly, purely amateur athletics in the new world of name, image, and likeness, well, you can make some money playing college basketball these days. Even six figures, even seven figures, supposedly. Now, I'm not saying that's what Isaiah is getting. I have no idea what Isaiah is getting. I'm not going to speculate. But if you've heard the speculation, he got some significant money to come to Missouri. That, that's all I'll say there. So if I can assume that there's some significant money there for Isaiah Mosley to play next season as well, well, to me, if I'm Mosley, I'd rather do that for another year than play in Greece. No offense to the nice people of Greece. It's a beautiful place, a wonderful place to play some basketball. But hey, if I'm Isaiah Mosley and I can play in my hometown for one more year and be the big man on campus. Well, that sounds pretty good to me, especially since that might actually be a better path potentially to the NBA because Isaiah still has NBA talent. And that's the thing. It's six foot five with some long arms and playmaking ability, scoring ability on top of that. He can be a really interesting guy, but on paper, I'm sorry, right now the numbers, it's just not going to excite anybody. I got a little bit of pushback from some people who acted like I was making drama about, well, why are you pointing out that Isaiah Mosley doesn't, isn't been shooting a lot of free throws this season? Well, it's really simple because 
especially if you're going to, if your three point shooting is going to be down just on paper, if I'm an NBA scout, I'm saying, well, this guy's shooting 29% from three in the sec at the high major level. That tells me that's not good enough for him to shoot at the next level. And on top of that, he's not getting to the foul line either. Again, just eight free throw attempts all season. And zero in the past few games, by the way. That hasn't really changed since he's come back after his, you know, multiple game sabbatical there. So at this point, I think it's a legitimate concern and certainly a legitimate thing to point out. I'm not saying that it won't change, and I'm not saying that maybe Isaiah will come back to Missouri next season, hit 40% of his three pointers, average 20 points a game, hit all the numbers that maybe our imaginations were running wild with this past off season. I think it could all happen for Isaiah. I just think once you logically look at this, where else is he going to go? I think he's going to stay at Missouri, stay with Coach Gates, who I think at this point he's earned his trust. Why not stick around for another year? I think that's actually his best path to being an NBA player as maybe somewhat slim of a chance as that is, there's still somewhat of a chance for him. I just think he's got to show more at the college level before he does it. And if I'm wrong, well, you know what? International ball is still going to be there a year from now, a year longer, and guess what? Once again, NIL, you can make some money while you're at it. And by the way, Kobe Brown, the other person I brought up in this equation, well, I said in the preseason that, hey, Kobe Brown is a versatile basketball player and that plays at the pro level he can move he's a legit six foot nine from what I've seen a thick guy at 250 pounds of mostly muscle it would seem from the outside looking in he's an impressive basketball player but I just said again hate to be reductive but he's gonna have to knock down some three pointers He's going to have to shoot the three a lot better than he had his first three seasons. Well, so far, so good. In fact, Kobe now hitting 47% from downtown on 63 attempts, by the way, 30 of 63 on the year for Kobe. A lot of those shots above the break. So that's one thing. And by above the break, I mean not in the two corners where it's a little bit shorter, by the way, which is a good thing. But the problem is at the NBA level, well, that line is even farther out, so he'll still have some questions there. But suddenly, Kobe Brown, listen, if he's suddenly – I haven't been following the NBA draft this season that particularly closely outside of the top few players. But if Kobe Brown come June is – well, before that even, the draft is June. But come April or May when he has a decision to make, if he's suddenly a first-round type prospect, well, see you later, Kobe. It's been fun. He should go chase that dream for sure. But, man, the NBA is so deep right now with international players and just basketball is as popular not only in the United States but worldwide as it's ever been. Just really tough to make it right now. And you, as a forward, as a, as a taller guy, you're, you're being asked to do much more than you ever have before. Can Kobe get there? I can actually kind of visualize it after this senior season he's had. But at the same time, if Kobe wants to come back for another year, well, there'll be some NIL money waiting for him too. So I think that unless Kobe Brown's looking like a first-round draft pick, I think he's going to come back to Missouri next year as well. Again, I don't have any inside information here. This is just me putting all the pieces together and looking at it logically as to me, the most likely thing that could happen at this point in time. And coming up, let's talk specifically about last night's game against LSU, and I'm going to compare Mohamed Diara to Shaquille O'Neal. But you know what? This year, the only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're happy to have them on board here at Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you're new, new to FanDuel, even better, down, download FanDuel now so you can get your Super Bowl 57 bet with a no-sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, FanDuel lets you bet on everything from money line, point spread, futures, the whole deal. 
And you know what? Congrats to you if you listen to me on going over the Missouri LSU total yesterday. Speaking of no sweat, we weren't sweating that one with a few minutes left in the ball game. That's always nice. But here's the best thing about FanDuel. It's safe, secure, easy to use, and you get paid your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel official sportsbook sponsor of the NFL. Locked on is heading to the senior bowl. Get inside analysis from the host that covered the NFL's next generation in college and find out which NFL draft boards these players will be climbing all in one location. Subscribe to locked on NFL draft for nightly live shows from the senior bowl. There's been a couple of the past two days, and there's one left tonight at 8 p.m. Central Time. In the past on this program, I've made reference to Steve Nash's Phoenix Suns teams from, say, 15 years ago or so at this point that were referred to as the seven seconds or less Suns because that's how quickly they attempted to get the ball up the court and get a shot in the air. Well, unfortunately for the Suns, while they won a lot of games and were very, very entertaining to watch, they never could get past the San Antonio Spurs. And eventually, I was actually listening to Raja Bell be interviewed this morning. He was a player, a role player, wing player for the, the Suns back in the day. And he was on the team when the Suns traded for Shaquille O'Neal. And Shaq at that time was definitely on the way down. He was past his peak, but was thought to be still a valuable player. And to Shaq's credit, Rajah Bell said this, Shaq was saying all the right things. He was saying, hey, I wanted to just fit in with this team. I want to run with them. You guys, I'll just be a, a guy that f tries to fit in and compliment what you all do. But unfortunately, it just never worked. In fact, the Suns did have to slow down to do what Shaq did best. And well, that was the beginning of the end for that era of that particular basketball team. And you know what? In retrospect, that was the wrong move. I kind of thought it was the wrong move at the time, but in retrospect, it was really the wrong move. What the Sun should have done is just keep doing what made them great. And eventually, they would have probably gotten past the Spurs at least one of those years because they had a great basketball team and some bad breaks that went against them in some really close series. To Ultimately, I think they got a little bit caught up in the results over the process because the process, they were doing the right things and they just couldn't quite get over the hump. But again, they got wrapped up in this idea that they needed somebody to beat Tim Duncan. Well, if you're a Missouri fan or a Missouri coach, it's sort of easy to think, well, we need our version of Shaquille O'Neal to grab every rebound and block every shot in the pain and all that good stuff. Well, my point is here, here's the beauty of Mohamed Diara, because to me, he's a guy that you could almost say was like the mid-season Shaq trade in a way, because, oh, hey, here's this big guy all of a sudden that we have to fit into this sort of spread them out, run and gun kind of team, a team that is one of the abs in terms of just average height is one of the shortest teams in the entire country, but yet one of the elite offenses in the entire country as well. But again, the beauty of Mohamed Diara is he does fix some things when he's in there that Missouri doesn't do well, in particular rebounding. Just last night, Mo played 14 minutes, grabbed 10 rebounds in just that short amount of time. Well, hey, there's, there's a nice skill that Missouri could use, by the way. And he also can, can obviously protect the rim and provide some needed height as well. Maybe not his greatest quality in terms of being a, an above the rim type of rim protector, but at the same time, at six foot ten, well, he's doing a lot better than most of Missouri's players as far as that goes. But the best part is, offensively, he's not just some stiff that you have to that can only be effective four feet from the basket. No, you can give him the ball 
in the corner. He can knock down a three. He can put the ball on the floor. And most importantly, again, the fact that he just can live on the perimeter means that he doesn't completely mess up Missouri's offense. How about that? A guy who can actually add without taking away. To me, that's the beauty of Mohamed Diara so far, is that, it, is that he's able to add to Missouri, add to their rebounding without taking away from their offense completely or, or slowing down their defense for that matter. Impressive stuff from him so far. And, of course, the coaching staff who has continued to obviously mold him and believe in him. And coming up after these quick words, my biggest take on the Missouri basketball season so far. You know, when you're like me and you follow Missouri basketball and just the sport in general for, well, at least as a side hustle, right? I, I make some money on this here podcast. Well, you tend to get caught up in the minutia a little bit, in the little details, arguments about how basketball should be played, whether it's, oh, we should switch this or not switch that or this kind of offense versus that kind of offense. No, you should play fast pace, but no, it's actually better if you slow it down and execute in the half court. These type of arguments are probably going to go on forever, and there's a bit of a give and take to all of them, right? But really, when you zoom out a little bit, basketball really is not that complicated. It's one of those things where when it's good, you know it's good. You just see it. It's just obvious. And to everybody I've talked to who cares even a little bit about Missouri basketball, from everybody who cares a little bit to a heck of a lot, well, there's not a single person I've talked to that hasn't enjoyed this season so far. That's the bottom line. This team is really, really fun to watch. And of course, winning is fun, but I think it goes beyond that. I'm just happy as a season ticket holder, as a fan. This is no longer a chore or a habit or an obligation for me. This is something that I look forward to once again. And don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed the 2021 Missouri basketball team for what it was, a hard-nosed group of, of seniors and guys that I had watched for a long time for the most part, including Jeremiah Tillman, Drew Smith, and Xavier Pinson and those guys. But at the same time, that was obviously the COVID season where, what, there was 1,500 people in Mizzou Arena or something like that. The whole thing was just sort of bizarre. And then, of course, you had the Kim Anderson eras and a lot, and a lot of Conzo Martin situations that sort of failed to live up to the hype. And, you know, again, just to see what Missouri has done in year one and to watch LSU last night. I mean, they're, LSU basically was in the same situation as Missouri for all intents and purposes. We can argue about the off-the-court stuff with Will Wade. Certainly, Conzo Martin left Missouri with a much better reputation just in terms of, well, the, the previous guy seemed to at least have some reputation. I'm like, uh, or excuse me. It seemed to, he at least had, he at least seemed to be an honorable guy. Unlike Will Wade, you got to give Conzo Martin that. But other than that, the situation was very, very similar. A first year coach, Dennis Gates versus Matt McMahon, a whole bunch of transfers, you know, 75% new roster practically. And you see the incredibly stark difference. As we talk today, Missouri looking like they're very much, they're what, three, four wins away from being an absolute lock to be in the NCAA tournament at this point, I would say. Then on the other side, you got LSU who lost all their games in January and we handed them their first one in February. Not looking up so good for the Tigers to the south of Missouri. So again, just another way of me saying, Dennis Gates, great job, pal. <laughs> we are enjoying what you're doing so far. Keep it up. And obviously, if I'm right, if my bold prediction from the first segment comes true and Isaiah Mosley and Kobe Brown come back, it's almost been assumed that Nick Honor's going to come back next season. There's several other guys that have that potential as well, plus three freshmen coming in with varied skill sets. Yeah, I'd say things are looking up for Missouri basketball, folks. And you know what? Thanks, as always, for joining me 
on this little journey I like to call Locked On Mizzou. And for your next journey, for your second listen, if you will, why not make it our brand new college basketball podcast? That's Locked On College Basketball. Isaac Shade, Andy Patton, a bevy of experts, coaches, and players throughout the college hoops landscape. That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get a finer podcasts. So, until next time, I'm John Miller, and thanks for listening to Locked on Mizzou.